is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Unspoiled, covering the Hunger Games prequel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. But who's the songbird and who's the snake? It's actually (laughs) pretty obvious. In this episode, we are covering chapters 11 and 12. In these, Lucy Gray is about to go into the arena and... I was about to call him Cornelius. Oh yeah. Coriolanus Snow is suddenly realizing I never really did anything for her. It was all about me. Mm-hmm. It's called growth. Welcome to Unspoiled. Are you, are you coming to the tree? They strung up a man. They say who murdered three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree Are you, are you coming to the tree Where dead men called out for his love to flee Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight Night in the tree. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I'm Rashawn. Okay, so real quick, I just want to talk about off the top. Rashawn and I, before we started recording, were um, discussing live reads, and I don't actually really have a moment that I want to live read in this book. If anybody out there has a moment that they think is really going to be like worthwhile. Remind me of it. It's possible I just forgot a little something. But if you have to remind me, I feel like that's not a great sign. I just think that anything that is sort of a surprise is undercut by this being a prequel and us knowing so much already. Mm. So, you know, just wanted to address the uh, live read elephant in the room. The elephant's wearing reading glasses. <laughs> Um, he's very dignified, very dignified, turns those pages with, uh, with this little trunk (laughs) and is precious. (laughs) Um, so yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way. And then Rashawn, there was something that you said you wanted to bring up, but that you can mention on the show. Oh yeah. It wasn't anything in particular. Like, you know, I was just, I had meant to mention to you before we started recording that, um, I, uh, took myself out to eat last night. Um, because I uh, have found that I haven't had like any kind of like alone time. Mm-hmm. And I took uh, the book with me and I went and treated myself to a very not fancy at all, very reasonably priced little sushi place that's walking mm. distance to my house. And Steve does not truck with sushi. And so he wasn't feeling much like eating dinner. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a walk and I'll take my little bookie book with me. And I had my sushi and I did not ask for a fork. I made myself use chopsticks and it would have been very painful if anybody were there watching me because your girl (laughs) is not very good, but I soldiered through. (laughs) Nice. Uh, And then um, I didn't take a bag with me and I had to stop at the grocery store on my way home. And um, the cashier who was fairly young, I could see them. I had my AirPods in, so I wasn't really talking, but I could see them trying to like angle to see what I was reading. And finally they got Mm -hmm. the courage to be like, Oh, so you're reading like, how is it? And we talked a little bit about, about the book. They haven't read it yet. And then they started talking about Harry Potter. And I was like, Oh, we're, we're doing this. Let's go. Let's go. And we started talking about how much better hunger games are than Harry Potter on the reread (laughs) as you get older, even though this, this person was still, like I said, very, very young. Um, but it was a cute little moment. And I got to like geek out with like, my cashier at my grocery store. Um, That's what the Phantom's yeah, all about, or what yeah. it's supposed to be all about. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. it was a nice little moment, and um, I could tell that they were like, you know, again, I'm not the target demo for these books. So there was like definitely there was a little bit of like, huh, look at this lady, this like this older lady reading this <laughs> book. I wouldn't expect her to be reading. <laughs> so, yeah, I could see that. 
So yeah, that was I, uh, a nice little moment. I'm glad that there was no accidental spoiling. No, yeah, they hadn't read it yet, so so I was I was safe in it. They were actually asking me like what I thought about it, and I was like, well, I don't want to say too much, and I don't want to spoil you, you know. It's like, but it's yeah, it's interesting. I'm like, you know, the POV it's written from is kind of like, do we even care? But you know, mm-hmm, you find mm-hmm. yourself end up being like kind of engrossed in the story, so. But I kept it like I didn't want to spoil them on, on anything really. But uh, but yeah, it was a fun little moment, and we and we both had like a very like because when they were talking about Harry Potter, they were like, yeah, you know, when you first read it when you're younger, you're like, oh, this is great, and then you go back and you're just like, mm, that's a little funky, Joanne. What you doing there? And I was like, exactly. <laughs> so. They're like, you know, it wasn't like a awkward kind of like me having to be like, yeah, I don't fuck with Harry Potter anymore. This person was clearly also, I don't fuck with Harry Potter like that anymore either. Like, it's not nice. nearly, you know, it's not nearly as good as we thought it was when we were giving her the benefit of the doubt at every other page. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Oh, God. She had so much goodwill and then she just fucking squandered it all. And it's just mm-hmm. a real, like, master class in how to fucking ruin your entire legacy yeah. and turn into a shit person for no re- no good reason at all. Hmm. Except maybe you were always kind of shitty. There it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right all right so let's get back to the uh much better than harry potter book well the, seri- <laughs> the main series i don't know if i want to include this in that uh in that description but well, for um, me it still has the potential you know yes i uh what did you feel about the moment where coriolanus is like everything i've done has been for myself because I really didn't believe that she was going to win. Cause we pick up right after she has said, you could do me a favor by believing I could actually win. Mm-hmm. I thought for a second, I was like, Oh, this is a real moment of like getting it. Mm-hmm. But then he, re- he regresses so quickly and so resoundingly <laughs> 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 that I was at the end, like, you know, what is that? All this work, and what did it get me? <laughs> like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Why did I do it? <laughs> I was just like, I thought we, I thought we had had a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it starts off, Lucy Gray's words stung, but on reflection were well-deserved. Coriolanus had never really considered her a victor in the games. It had never been part of his strategy to make her one. He had only wished that her charm and appeal would rub off on him and make him a success. Even his encouragement to sing for sponsors was an attempt to prolong the attention she brought him. Only moments ago, her healed hands were good news because she could use them to play the guitar on interview night, not to defend herself from an attack in the arena. The fact that she mattered to him, as he'd claimed in the zoo, only made things worse. He should have been trying to preserve her life, to help her become the victor no matter the odds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a a moment here. And uh, she says, you're, you know, the, the only person who ever bothered to show up other than Sejanus and acted like we were really human beings. So help me actually get through this and he promises they're in it to win it now they're gonna come up with a strategy yep Yep. we're a team now yeah we're we're a team and uh yeah they go he asked her like in this newfound sort of sense of okay how can i how can we come up with a winning strategy he starts asking her some questions and one of the things he asked her about is whether or not she could kill someone and mm-hmm. she's like, well, um, maybe maybe I could do it in self-defense. And he has to be like, well, everything in the Hunger Games is self-defense. Yeah. And I was like, well, there that is. That yeah, is, in fact, true. Solid point. Um, but then immediately they decide, he decides that, like, her best bet is going to be running and hiding. Because she's just mm-hmm. not, like in a position to to take on anybody physically. And also she's going to have, he says the benefit of sponsors. 
keeping her alive yeah. that, that the other tributes might not have. And then we find out, you know, a little bit later that that part at least is, is true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that pays off. It's nice that it's not like he's just full of shit, mm-hmm. you know, about this whole thing. Um, so he leaves and goes to class and we have another fucking hippity hoppity from Dr. Gall. This hmm. bitch is so crazy. She's really, really, really creepy. Yeah. I can't yep. even, uh, like, I don't know what to do do with her <laughs> <laughs> that's she, kind of where he's also at yeah like, like. <laughs> yeah like this, this is this she is just like like when his his uh sort of what he decides the best way to handle and i think he gets this this advice from tigress is just like if i can stay out of her way stay mm-hmm. off her radar and stay out of her way and i was like that is yes do that yeah Absolutely. It does seem like the really (laughs) only option that he has that's like safe at this point. Don't be interesting. Don't don't make her hmm, wonder what's going on. No, you don't want none of that. You don't none of that. Fade, please, into the background. Whenever whenever you are in the room with her, like Homer into the hedges. Because I I, I was just about to say I want somebody to make that meme, but with the actor (laughs) who plays Coriolanus face (laughs) photoshopped onto it. You know, it's the only way to be safe around her i feel like if you if you pique her curiosity that's like the most dangerous thing because she she views everything around her the students the faculty the tributes as playthings as Mm -hmm. as as objects to be sort of studied poked and prodded and experimented on you know what i mean like like i think she treats everything around her that way and if uh Corio becomes even a little bit intriguing to her. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's not where you want to be. Of course, uh, Janus uh, yeah. too. I need somebody to give Janus that advice. Yo, so Janus really is <laughs> like it, it, it's. Um, there's a part of me that is really respecting yes. the fact that he is just not really afraid of her, but I can't mm-hmm. tell if that's bravery or if it's just like, he doesn't know how far she'll go. I think it has to be the second one because nobody would believe that she did what she did to Clemencia. I think he does not have a good understanding of the type of person that he's dealing with when he's dealing with Dr. Gall. I think he is treating her no differently than any other professor teacher that he's had and that he's expecting her to operate within a certain um in in a certain uh accepted rules of how we engage and how we behave right Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. he he doesn't he doesn't expect her to be as crazy as she actually is <laughs> and as dangerous as she actually is. Like, as you know what I mean? Like he just, he's yeah. not for whatever reasons, he's not clocking that he's, he's treating her like, what's the worst she can do? Suspend me, expel me. No, bro. That's not the worst she can do. No, nah, <laughs> that's, sure that's not it at all. <laughs> Poor thing. <sighs> There's um a point in a book series that I covered and, uh, I'm not going to tell you which just because I don't want to spoil it in case we ever do cover it. But this girl who kind of comes from the mean streets and in a way that's actually feels legit and not like, Ooh, here's somebody who doesn't know what the mean streets are. (laughs) Um, (laughs) She goes into this place with there's these established rules and people are expecting her to have a certain reaction to certain things. And instead she just grabs somebody by the hair and smashes their face into a table until they give her what she wants. And this person in the midst of her smashing their face and breaking their nose is like, you can't just, and she's like, I can't, I can, I can just, I am just (laughs) right now. And that is something that I think about all the time is like, Mm -hmm. you can't just is in my mouth every day like the past decade and then being like, no, they can, yep. they can just yep. like 
you know, the yep. rules. The rules that are we rules all because thought. Because we have agreed. But if they don't agree. Exactly. Then what? Exactly. If, they, if they're if they not agreeing to play by the same rules and they have an entirely different set. And if you're not willing to also play by those rules, you're going to find yourself at a, at a, at a disadvantage mm-hmm. almost immediately. Uh, which is where this country has found itself in a disadvantage because we have, were working under an assumption that there were rules in place. Yeah. And that everybody had agreed to them. And then someone showed up who did not agree to those rules and, and, and became fucking president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we didn't have anything in place to stop it because we had been operating as if the agreed upon rules were set in stone. We never bothered to set them down in stone though. We That's just exactly we, we just it. agreed to it. So we just yeah. thought that any rational mm-hmm. fucking human being would see that this is to all of our ultimate benefit. And uh And really that was whoa. our fucking mistake because what in our history has ever suggested that that we were mm-hmm. capable of that? Literally no time in our history have we ever behaved as good as we could possibly be. We've never been at our very True. best in this fucking country. Of course somebody showed up to exploit that. <laughs> like, of course they did. <laughs> mm. Grim. So, uh, yeah, they have this whole thing. He tries to, like, just be like, I don't even know why I came to class today. I'm out of here. And he tries for this dramatic exit. But the door is locked from the outside so he can't just leave oh yeah something like that that admission especially because the dean is sitting right there is so chilling to me that he's like apparently totally impotent yeah you know i don't like it yeah uh, all the dean can do is just be like, hey, look, the doors are locked from the outside and the peacekeepers have already been given their, their orders um, to not disturb us until, he says, until notified. Right. And like, you would think the dean could just notify them at this mm-hmm. moment and he does not. And But Dr. Gall is like, oh, well, we can have somebody chaperone you somewhere else. <laughs> if you really want to get out. So she is like, yeah, I'll notify him, but I'll tell them to take him to see your dad. And that just completely lets all the air out of his hot balloon. It's very hot. Balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten oh as I was going God. for that analogy that hot balloons were a real thing that already existed and were their own thing. <laughs> so now I just have a very funny picture in my head. <laughs> uh, so he turns around. Coriolanus is just like, there's an empty seat next to me. And it's like, I genuinely don't know why I just said that. Yeah. That I and thought Janus was fascinating. comes over and is like, why do you keep doing this? And he says, I can't seem to help myself. Yeah. Yeah. That I think was he means interesting it. to me. Yeah, I do too. The fact that he offers up the seat unprompted and then is as surprised as everybody else was a real moment for me. And it is, I was just like, what is, what is going on with this guy? Mm -hmm. Like, what is, what is the deal with? He's so choreo swings, like, uh, you know, like a pendulum. He's like one minute. He's so, I guess it's not unheard of to be self-involved teenager, but he's so self-involved and so self-serving. And then he swings and he's offering a seat to Sejanus, but then he's trying to convince himself and us, the reader that really his, his sort of what he has cultivated is a sort of neutrality about Sejanus. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in action, this is not neutral. No. You know what I mean? Especially in light of the way Sejanus just went off mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I I just, I, I don't know. I guess we are watching, and we've talked about this before, but, but really what we're going to do is we're going to watch how this young man who is clearly conflicted on a 
much deeper level than he's he was aware of. Like I think Coralinus had a very firm sense of who he was, right? Mm-hmm, like he had mm-hmm. himself really figured out. Like there were no surprises going on in between his ears. And then this thing with the Hunger Games comes up and he meets Lucy Gray and it starts to cause him to, I, I want to say question things, but that's not actually accurate, but it, but it opens up something in him, right? Yeah. It, something. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's opening up something in him that has been closed that he has not bothered to really look at or investigate probably because it wasn't going to serve the goals that he had in mind for himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And now these things are being kind of like picked at a little bit between Lucy, between Sejanus with his, his close involvement with the hunger game. So it's not necessarily that these are like redeem, like him asking Sejanus to, Hey, you can sit next to me. Not that it's necessarily redeeming him, but it's, it's showing that there's, another part of him that he probably hasn't given a lot of room to breathe. It's probably, yeah. really, I would imagine not super comfortable with it because he, you know, does seem genuinely baffled at like, why am I <laughs> having this reaction? Um, and then the, the, I, I, I appreciate the, and we get this a lot too, even though we don't, we don't always have a, like a lot of time to talk about it, but the, the interjections from the other students in the class I find very, very illuminating um, because it keeps reminding me that um, all of these capital kids, their experience of the war is so different from the remembrances of the people from the original trilogy what their experience of the war is. And so we have like these kids that some of them are like wildly anti district uh, you mm-hmm. know like hovering if not fully immersed in just straight up bigotry you know can you have class bigotry you can right of does, course. That, does that work is that the right oh, word sure. for it okay um and you know and then but some of the other kids are just like uh well the war's over so if the war's over we should be done with the killing part, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I just really appreciate having like this, this additional conversation. Um, so we get other people's like sort of other people's points of view and uh, they, and the kids like go back and forth with each other, you know? Yeah. Oh, and then one of the kids is like, I'm beginning to think it'll never be over. The districts will always hate us and we'll always hate them. And that's when Dr. Gall is like, I think you might be on to something. So let's consider that war is a constant. The conflict may ebb and flow, but it will never really cease. Then what should be our goal? And I was like, shit. Yeah, and the thing here is the... She knows that Coriolanus has an answer. Mm-hmm. And he is trying not to fucking participate mm-hmm. because she's creepy. But because she has such a clear view of him, she does not let him off the hook at all. Mm-hmm. Comes right and, up to him. Yeah. And just puts him on the spot and is like, uh, so, Snow, any any suggestions? Mm-hmm. And he comforted himself with the thought that she was old and no one lived forever. <laughs> that line <laughs> is so immaculate. Like, oh, it uh, really is. It I really love it is. so much. Every now and then you come across something when, when reading where you're just like, oh shit, did that take like time to come up with? Or did that just like right off the dome? Or were you like in a position one day where that was what you had to comfort yourself with? Like, I want to know. Um, but yeah, he says we control it. 
If the war is impossible to end, then we have to control it indefinitely, just as we do now, with the peacekeepers occupying the districts with strict laws and with reminders of who's in charge, like the Hunger Games. In any scenario, it's preferable to have the upper hand to be the victor rather than the defeated, though in our case, decidedly less moral, Sejanus Mm. muttered. It's not immoral to defend ourselves, Livia shot back. And who wouldn't rather be the victor than the defeated? I don't know that I have much interest in being either, said Lysistrata. But that wasn't an option, Coriolanus reminded her, given the question. Not if you think about it. Which I think what he's saying is just like, if the war doesn't end, you can't win. Right. Because that's just the nature of it going on forever like that is... You know, um, the subtlety of that and that he understands it. Yeah. And that it feels like Dr. Gall was waiting for this answer. Yeah. He even says uh, he had to keep himself from blurting out the answer. It was so obvious. It was too obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> and then uh, Dr. Gall repeats Snow's not if you think about it to Dean Highbottom. Not if you think about it, eh, Casca? A little thought can save a lot of lives. And it just says, uh, Dean Highbottom doodled on the list. (laughs) Dean Highbottom is really giving, like, drunk in the corner, just being like, "Uh, no, don't talk to me. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to be in this class. I'm locked in here, same as (laughs) y'all. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so this is when he has a little chat with uh, Sejanus afterwards about how he can't seem to control it. And Sejanus says, I don't know what I'd do if you weren't here. That woman is evil. She should be, she should be stopped. Coriolanus felt any attempt to dethrone Dr. Gall would be futile, but he adopted a sympathetic manner. You tried. I failed. I wish my family could just go home, back to District 2 where we belong. Not that they'd want us. Mm. Being capital is going to kill me. It's a bad time, said Janus. With the games and the bombing, no one is at their best. Don't do anything rash like running off. And then he thinks to himself, because I might need a favor. This fucking guy. (laughs) I swear to God. It's a fucking poor Sejanus. It's just like running off. Where? How? With what? Where would I go? I really do appreciate your support, though. I wish I could think of some way to thank you. Which, like, the fact that <laughs> that comes immediately after Corio thinking to himself, I might need a favor, is wild. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just a real peek at like what I think some relationships really are like, you know, there's somebody who is always a taker and there's somebody who is always a giver and the giver doesn't even notice because it is such a natural response for them. Yeah. That there's no sense of feeling like they're being taken advantage of because they're being manipulated so expertly. And the taker probably doesn't even think they're doing anything wrong because right. he offered, he said, right. like, and you know, also, like, when when you're a uh, like you don't even have to, I mean, I mean, you can manipulate people, obviously, you know, and he's Snow specifically, you know, knows how to play people very well. But to your point, when you come across somebody that's a, naturally a giver, you just let them do what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, you generally don't have to do much in the way of prompting or prodding because they're, their natural state of being is to give and um, same thing for takers, even though that tends to have a much more negative connotation, but that is their natural state of being is to receive, you know, they don't Mm -hmm. know how to be anything other than that. They did work. They weren't taught. They never learned or not capable, whatever the underlying thing might be. Um, it's just a natural state. So Janus is just naturally, um, well, I don't want to say naturally, but his circumstances have lent himself to be a giver because he feels, it seems like 
what they have is ill-gotten gains. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he seems to be very uncomfortable with his family's position. He's very uncomfortable with the way his family climbed the social ladder. Got a lot of survivor's guilt, clearly, right? For the people yeah. left behind. So he's like an exceptionally easy mark uh, for someone like Snow. Uh, Snow doesn't have to even work very, very hard, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, he doesn't even, yeah. He has one thought and already this dude's ooh. offering, like... You know, I am now, curious with the fact that Livia says like, it, it, ooh, "I'm sorry, guys. I was just trying to. I was, all I was trying to do was get my lotion for my hands." <laughs> um, she says like, "It's not uh, immoral to defend ourselves," and I, I don't know what these kids have been told the war was about, and that's what I'm sort of curious about. Like, I have to assume information is distorted sure so completely by the time they get it so i really am curious what they know greedy and what they've been told through propaganda that is completely untrue greedy ungrateful resent they resent our lifestyle the people in the districts resent our lifestyle not because of the poverty that they find themselves in the districts living under right they resent our lifestyle because we are so free and we are so sophisticated and uh you know um it's like what you know they're jealous of our freedom mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah i haven't heard that they one. hate freedom that's what they want <laughs> um and i would imagine um because so little by the time we get to the or to the by the time we get to the original books, it's such a weird sentence because that doesn't make sense time time wise. But but by the time we get to Katniss's story, we know that the people in the capital know very little about what the day to day life is like for people in the districts. Yeah. So I have to imagine at this period of time, uh, right after the war, when communication is so dicey, they probably had even less information about what the day to day life was like in the districts. So. They are, these kids are growing up with like no understanding of what the hardships are. Yeah. And, and, and they, and they probably are doing that thing where it's like, oh, these people in the districts, you know, when we, when it's time for reaping and we, we see them at the reaping and everybody is dirty and disheveled and raggedy and, and, and impoverished and all of that is, a moral failing all of that is a reflection right. of their their laziness right or their it's evidence it, that they aren't as good as us exactly yeah. as opposed to being evidence of how they're treated and oppressed um and i mean that propaganda is is it's it's gonna it's gonna work nine and a half times out of ten that's why yeah, people keep going to it because it's 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 really 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 effective you know I mean, we all are fall victim to it, whether we, you know, no matter how fucking hip we think we are, we have to all be, I think, forever mindful because you can be propagandized, you know, in all these different ways. And it's so insidious. I saw the really quick, 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 quick tangent. I caught a piece of a press conference of, uh, is a police officer, chief or whomever, and he said, um, the young man's body was found, um, had drowned in, in a, in water or something like the drowning water, obviously, but like, I'm not sure exactly where it was, but the cop is like, a young man was found dead, say yesterday afternoon at four o'clock. He was born in 2019. And then that was the only clip I saw of the the uh, press conference. And mm-hmm. the thing about that is if you if you didn't catch it when I said it, young man, uh-huh. Mhm. Born and he's 6, not five? yet. 5, 5, like four and a half, five years old. But he's a young man. 
And like, if you guys want to wager a guess of the color of that child, mm-hmm. it was decidedly brown. <laughs> shocked, shocked. <laughs> well, not that shocked. You know, but like, you know, these very little, like, we always think propaganda is going to look like a fucking film from the 50s or whatever, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. not. It's not at all. <laughs> it's going to be these little tiny moments that you don't even, you know, pay attention to, but are subtly changing the way you think about things and the way you think about people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like talking about women who are well really girls who are being trafficked Mm -hmm. as like sex workers when yep they're minors and don't want to be here or even if they did who cares they're minors and they shouldn't be here like 12 year old prostitute i'm sorry what that's not a thing that's not a thing at all Mm -hmm. what are you the fuck are you talking about yeah Mm -hmm. same thing um so we go from there to cory lane is going to visit pluribus uh bell who had a nightclub and coriolanus is currently on a search for a guitar right because they want to do a performance i will say when sejanus asks is is there anything i can do and corio is like yeah i do need a favor that's what he asked he asked for Mm -hmm. a guitar so he asked for something on its face that's for lucy gray right but 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 we know it's also ultimately about him because everything comes back to me right so i love the idea that like on 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 the surface you're like oh he's using his favor for her is he is he though (laughs) i love when he goes and asks vipsania sickle and she says Oh, I think we used to have one during the war. Let me check and get back to you. I'd love to hear your girl sing again. Mm -hmm. He didn't know whether or not to believe her. The Sickles did not impress him as a musical crowd. (laughs) Vipsania had inherited her aunt Agrippina's love of competition. And for all he knew, she was trying to spoil Lucy Gray's performance. But two could play at that game. So he told her she was a lifesaver and then continued his search. (laughs) I am desperate to know if he's right about this or if this is just him thinking everybody has the same motivations he does. We get like, we never find, like, I was wondering too. I was like, well, maybe she really did go ass. Maybe she really Mm -hmm. found one. You didn't even bother to follow up on that because he's just like, no, I'm not going to give you the chance to fuck me. I see you. I see what you're up to. (laughs) (laughs) You're all against me. (laughs) So, yeah, when he goes to see Pluribus, there's a moment where this cat greets him, Boa Bell. Yeah. And I just really want to point out that, like, when we first see Buttercup with Katniss, she's like, I wanted to kill that cat so many times. And then, like, the worst person we know, Snow, is like, oh, kitty, and picks her up and is described as an old friend. And I really do like those tropes just being, like, flipped on their head because we have such a thing where we're just like, if an animal doesn't like you, you yeah. must be evil. And yep. if an animal does like you, you must be decent. Mm-hmm. And th- this author is just being like, or they just want warm pets. Right. They don't right. Exactly. Or, or they're just <laughs> animals. And- <laughs> yeah. How about that? <laughs> um, so Corey, Corey Linus also is able to let down his guard with Pluribus and because you know, he's one of the few people that knows how bad they're off financially. Yeah. And he's always been discreet about it. So Corey Landis, Corey o is never worried that he's going to let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. If the snows have fallen on such hard times. And still treats the family really well. And with the respect that, that snow thinks that, you know, they're due. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then we get... Is this when we can find out, I believe this conversation, is when he lets it drop that Snow's dad and Dean Highbottom were like- Used to be besties. Besties. Cutting it up. Yeah. Every night at the club. Living it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had said something about maybe them being in school together, mm-hmm. but I had said 
maybe that they like butted heads and that's why Dean Highbottom didn't see it for Snow is because he just saw his father in him. Uh, and that could still be the case because I, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I was not prepared to find out that they were like homeboys. You know, it just yeah. seemed like I was like, oh, really? And apparently, so was uh, so was Snow. He was also like, really. I hated that he did not stay and get more answers. Like, how do we? How are we just going home? Yeah, he what just, are you doing? He, a customer that interrupts the conversation, That's and it. he's just like, well, I guess I'll leave. And so I would have had. I just sat right down. Mm-hmm. I just sat right down. Let him handle that customer. <laughs> So while he was there, he gets a, a guitar, a really like beautiful one. And Pluribus is very impressed with Lucy Gray. And this is like, you know, maybe if she wins, I'll get her to come to my club because mm-hmm, she's mm-hmm. just like really got something. Um, so it says the next few days were devoted to readying Lucy Gray for the interview, which had been set for Saturday night. Each mentor tribute pair had been assigned a classroom to work in. Two peacekeepers were on guard, but Lucy Gray had been freed of both chains and cuffs. Tigress had provided an old dress of hers, saying that if Lucy Gray was willing to trust her, she could wash and iron her rainbow ruffles for the broadcast. Lucy Gray hesitated, but when he gave her Tigress other gift, a small cake of soap shaped like a flower and smelling of lavender, she had him turn his back while she changed. So mm. once she's like on screen, she's just in overall way better shape in terms of appearance than like anybody else. This is so wild to me that these poor kids are being thrown up. Like it hasn't occurred to the Capitol to prepare their tributes to be broadcast. I mean, like physically prepare them, like give them nice right. outfits, hair, makeup, and like none of that is happening. None of that. She's the first and only one to get a sort of makeover. And all it really is, is kind of like a bath and her same old dress being kind of like cleaned laundry. Up. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's the extent of the makeover. Um, and that it's just so, it's such a different, vibe to the whole yeah. thing like i really wouldn't want to watch a bunch of impoverished malnourished dirty you know children mm-hmm. fight to the death either like i don't want to watch anybody fight to the death quite frankly but if i have to you know what i mean yeah definitely <laughs> you know like give me Give me something more than the the stark reality of that's really what is missing, right? There's missing in the later books or the earlier books, the first books. There, the the reality of what's happening is so far removed. Yes, but this is it's it's like right up close and personal. Like there's no mm-hmm. there's no comfortable distance. No wonder nobody wants to watch any of this shit. Like there's you know. Yeah, it's really interesting because my instinct keeps being to, like, say that probably people want to see this because they're still so angry because these are all people who, like, were just lived through this war recently. And there was an attack where bombs went off recently. And so maybe they're just feeling vicious and and vengeful. But, like, they're not. It's been mentioned many times that nobody wants Mm -hmm. to watch it. Mm -hmm. So it's not even, like, the you know, that aspect of things isn't even... Right, the problem, so and, to speak, and I think that, uh, and I guess we'll get maybe maybe we'll get to it explicitly in the book, um, but like the the way to get people to buy in to the games um, is you have to, as the capital viewer, you have to have some sort of reasonable deniable deniability like you have to be able to convince yourself that somehow being a part of the games is better than the alternative of your drab life at home in your in your you know musty district right you get to come to the capital and get treated really well and get you know made beautiful and get dressed beautifully you know and isn't this a treat so that yeah. you, so so that you don't feel like such a piece of shit for engaging mm-hmm. in it, and 
nothing about any of this so far is a treat. Nothing about these games is a, like there's no way to watch these games and not feel, I think, implicated. And nobody wants to feel that. Nobody wants to feel complicit. You know, you want to feel like magnanimous. And, and that becomes a, that. A, a, a like question later when Snow is talking to Tigress and she's just like, we all have done things we're not proud mm-hmm. of. And he's like, no, you haven't. And she's just like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you say and, so. <laughs> and he realizes like, he, at first he tries to be, I had no idea. And then he's like, didn't I though? Yep. Maybe I just didn't want to. Maybe I just didn't want to ask. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe you didn't. How about the host being a flickerman? I didn't know. How it about? A, it's a family business, apparently. <laughs> the clownish capital TV weatherman, Lucretius Lucky Flickerman. Both glaringly inappropriate and surprisingly welcome on the heels of all the killing. Mm -hmm. Lucky was dressed in a high-collared blue suit with rhinestone accents. His gelled hair was dusted in coppery powder, and his mood could only be described as merry. Wow. (laughs) He fucking does some, like magic tricks mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just like pulling bird, shit out of a hat and bird stuff comes flying out of a sleeve <laughs> i cannot what 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 a zany thing to do um and then he does the like first uh announcement of the fact that they're going to have this sponsor thing and explains how it works and he says that people can go down to their post office um, and they can either buy them a gift or place a bet. Um, starting tomorrow, they would be open from eight in the morning until eight at night, giving people time to place their bets before the Hunger Games kicked off on Monday. After he'd introduced the new wrinkle in the games, Lucky had little to do but read the cue cards with the material that wrapped around the interviews, but he managed to work in a few magic tricks like pouring different colored wine from the same bottle to toast the capital and having a pigeon fly out of his bell sleeve jacket. <laughs> this is so goofy. <laughs> ah, agonizing. The so then we get tributes. like a montage, basically, yeah. of all of their tributes. Lackluster. <laughs> there's one there's a one kid who is like i can start a fire with my glasses but they don't actually demonstrate that they just talk about like the science behind how it would work <laughs> oh my God. um there's so much about like one of them just picks up his mentor on a chair uh-huh uh-huh just to show how uh, just to be is. like i'm very strong and it's so interesting because like this is the exact thing that we were told not to do in the original to like give the game away about what your skills and, mm-hmm. and ad- advantages are even the uh the test that you get scored on is done in secret yep you know here we get a display of somebody's strength we find out that there's a kid who can kill somebody five different ways with a sewing needle. Uh, There's a girl from District 4 who is really handy with a trident. She doesn't have a trident for the interview, so she just has like a fucking broomstick that she's whipping around on stage. (laughs) Uh, We're back to tridents. Mm -hmm. But the the fact that they don't even give them the tools to demonstrate their prowess in any kind of way. They just mm-hmm. have to kind of like declare, well, I can, I can do this and I could maybe do that. And look at me with this. Like I can whip a broomstick around too. It doesn't mean I can kill somebody with a trident, but <laughs> I love the idea that it was like, they didn't bring the broomstick or anything. She's just like, I could do it. And some, does anybody have like anything, you know, <laughs> long, like, do we have a broom somewhere that we can? Yeah. Hold on. Jim's bringing a broom. Thanks, Jim. Like how unprepared this whole thing f- probably is. Mm-hmm. It's just so janky. It's so janky. It really is. It really, this is really my particular is. like favorite part of the book in a lot of ways because just getting to see how 
ramshackle <laughs> the games were, I just think is really, really fascinating. So, <laughs> uh, there's, oh, right. Fieven Ravenstill, the president's grandnephew, was trying to make an impression with the District 11 girl, Dill. But Coriolanus couldn't figure out his angle because she'd become so sickly, even her coughs were barely audible. Oof, yeah, going in that sick. That is yeah. really rough. That's not going to work out well. That's a shame. Um, so then, yeah, they go last because District 12 is last. And um, it's uh, time for her to perform. And she sings this song. Now, we find out they had spent a lot of time together going over different songs that she could possibly perform. And he'd heard at least a half a dozen different songs. Mm -hmm. And yet, she opens with this song that he has not heard. And I yeah. was like, oh, here we go. What is she about to do? <laughs> <laughs> And it turned out to not be anything like what I thought it was going to be. What did I you think it was going to be? I thought she was going to sing something that really like just read the Capitol for Phil. Yeah. That's what I thought she was about to do. But instead, it turns out to be a very personal song um, that Corio interprets as a song to a former lover and feels a real way about it. Yo, this is so unexpected for me. Like, how did you feel about this? He is so fucking jealous. I was shocked that it went this deep. But then, so, a couple of things. Uh, he's torn because it's clear she has knocked this out of the park. Like, the audience is eating it up. There's, like, thunderous applause and an ovation. And... Um, he knows that this is like a win and he should be like ec ecstatic about it but instead he's feeling just salty and jealous mm -hmm. and I, again I was very surprised by it but then the very next page it, the surprise is evaporated because it all becomes about him yeah yeah. She belongs to Coriolanus Snow. Might have been different if you landed, if you didn't land your rainbow girl. Uh, the truth is, we were also busy killing each other. We forgot how to have fun. She knows, though, your girl. These are all different things people have said to him about Lucy, Lucy Gray. And his girl, his, she belongs to him. Um, even Sejanus tried to trade me for her. If that isn't ownership, then what is? And I just could not believe what I was reading. I didn't know Honestly. it went that deep. I will tell you what I thought when I first, because it, the chapter ends with what he really felt was jealous. Mm -hmm. And what I thought initially upon hearing that was that he was jealous of the attention she was getting without necessarily needing him. Oh. That it was like the fact that everybody was congrat like, just so impressed with her performance and really all he had done was grab her a uh, guitar, but mm -hmm. it was all her. I thought it was him just sort of being like, well, what about me? And then when I realized like, Oh no, it's, it's like a lot more personal than that. Mm -hmm. I, it was almost like I was relieved I felt like, oh, th well, that's better, right? And then I sort of stopped and was like, I mean, like a little, but not really. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 because of the way he reacts to the song, like in the in the immediate moments after she's done, he says or he thinks to himself, he knew the gifts would pour into the arena for her. That her success, even now, reflected back on him, making it his success. Snow lands mm -hmm. on snow lands on top, and all that. So he's like, even in this immediate moment, he's like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah. This is all shiny for me. That's all great, and I'm still jealous." Yeah, and that's when I was like, "Oh, oh." <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, the song had been a clear success, but he somehow felt betrayed by it, even humiliated, sir. Mm-hmm. And she kind of like he he holds her hand after they leave the stage, but he like g- holds on tighter as she tries to pull mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. And it's clear she senses that he didn't like it, and she brings it up later. But she has a completely wrong idea about. Yeah what it was he didn't like and he has to sort of explain this whole thing yeah i love when he's like thinking to himself right after he's talking about how you know uh it's his girl it's his she that belongs to him and all that shit he says with her song she had repudiated all of that with a song featuring a life that had nothing to do with him and a great deal to do with someone else this idea that they exist before they become tributes is something he had never taken time to think about, even though they had had conversations about what their lives were like, you know, he knows about her parents and the Covey and all that. It somehow still didn't hit for him that, yeah, she had a whole ass life before her name was called. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is like fueling, his humiliation. Yeah. You know, how dare she almost, you know? This dude needs therapy. Ciao. <laughs> All the dudes. <laughs> <sighs> so, yeah, and she says, um, I left some loose ends back in District 12. Me being tribute, well, there's bad luck, and then there's bad business. No, that was a bad line. business. That's and a lot. Someone, <laughs> someone who owed me plenty had a hand in it. The song was payback of a kind. Most people won't know that, but the Covey will get the message loud and clear, and they're all I really care about. So, yeah. This sounds like a setup. Hey. Our girl was set up. It hmm. seems like. Hmm. And uh, I love I love this. Uh, he, he's like, it was only one time, one hearing. Like, who's going to get that message? And it went by really fast. And she's just like, my cousin Maude only needs to hear it the one time. She never forgets anything with a tune. And uh, and that's all that is really said about that. But I was desperate for more information. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know, know why he doesn't ask. Because he doesn't want to know. Like, it's. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. I'm even asking that question. Yeah. It it looks like like the way it's raised, written, it's like, oh, our time is up here. It looks like I'm being rounded up again, so they run out of time. But he has opportunity to see her later and doesn't it bring any of this really back up, I don't think. Um so Yeah. Um so yeah, they take her back. Just like the- I love th- there's a point later where uh, Pluribus is like, oh, wasn't she stellar? I'm so glad you got her. And he's silly old man with his ridiculous powdered wig and his decrepit cat. What did he know about anything? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Sir, I'm going to need you to come back down to earth, my friend. You sound like a real little bitch. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's, he's salty about it until uh, his teacher shows up and is like, I think the prize is in the bag. And then mm-hmm. that like calms him down. Um, God, he sees the Janus and Janus's mother. Snow is really a very nasty little number. Yeah, he is. He, he is, uh, y'all. He's 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 mm, he's no is no good. Is no good. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever that's in him that Lucy Gray is possibly touching that might be like a kernel of goodness. It is small and withered and it would need to be exposed to a lot of sunlight to grow into something other than what he became Mm. because the way he like so Janus is there with his mother and he is like overly you know he's he's putting it on so thick he expects I don't want to skip the intro though oh go ahead so Janus appeared in another brand new suit with a rumpled little woman in an expensive flowered dress on his arm. It didn't matter. You could put a turnip in a ball gown and it would still beg to be mashed. Coriolanus had no doubt this could only be Ma. Mm-hmm. 
Good God. Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, you can wear the nicest clothes you want. I can still see that you are nothing. Yep. And then says to her, what an honor. Please forgive my negligence. I've been meaning to write you to thank you for the fucking food that you gave me. Because I've been starving. I've been literally starving. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the delicious casserole. And she is so tickled and uh, appreciative and kind of probably, you know, because Snow is from such a um, auspicious family, you know, coming from him probably means a lot, you know, so she's, Mm -hmm. she's just like, she's so grateful to Snow for being a good friend, what she thinks is a good friend to her son. And once again, makes an offer. If there's anything you ever need, I hope you know you can count on us. And he says, uh, you know, it goes both ways. Laying it on so thick, she was sure to be suspicious. But not Ma. Her eyes filled with tears as she made a gurgling sound, having been rendered speechless. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. God, I hate this so much. (laughs) it's just the the how pleased and grateful she it just makes me so sad Mm -hmm. you know it's funny i said something earlier about dr gall about how she sees people around her as sort of objects to be experimented on and to be poked and prodded and you know snow is not very different from her in that respect maybe not necessarily experimented on in the grotesque way but viewing people everyone he meets as not people but objects to be moved and placed into different positions that benefit him you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh like pieces on a chessboard or whatever like they're not they're not real people you know, for the most part. And maybe that's what this thing with Lucy Gray is, is that in for whatever reason, even if it's only moments and flashes, Lucy Gray manages to be a real person to him hmm. for, for moments, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not constant or, or um, consistent. But there are flashes of it where he he really does move through the world eyeing other people and and putting them in categories. Oh, you fit here. You fit here. You fit here. Yeah. Um, And then Lucy comes along and he has every intention of putting her in a very specific category for his purposes. But she manages to cut through that somehow, like her charm, her beauty, her foreignness, her whatever, whatever you want to chalk it up to her. Mm -hmm. But, um, and there's a word for people who do this, but I don't know what it is. I can't think of what it is, but that see that that don't see other people as like real people. Like every, every person is like a, what is it that they, they call them? What is it in video games? What's that expression? Oh, an NPC. Yeah. 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 You know, like he's like, it's like snow is a real person. Tigress is a real person. People who can do things for him. If they're far up enough in power, maybe they are real people too. But mm-hmm. every everybody else is not, you know. It's got real main mm-hmm. character. Is it main character <laughs> syndrome? Main character <laughs> syndrome. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the main character syndrome thing is so fascinating because I definitely have been in that headspace plenty in my life. You know, I I know that about myself. And uh it's so tempting to be like, nowadays it's even worse. And I don't think that's true i think that things look like that because i'm old Mm. but uh i i love the main character syndrome as a short like it gets it's one of those things where it's overused of course because everything that we ever come up with we just do to death and eventually bad people get a hold of it and turn it around and mean a whole other thing yeah but i really do love it as a shorthand for a certain like mindset because it just gets to the fucking heart of the matter in in such a a concise way you know yeah um 
But anyway, so this is when he has the chat with Tigris about the whole thing. And he's like, what do you think she was suggesting happened in her song? Well, it sounds like she had a bad time of it. Someone broke her heart. That was only half of it, he said. There was that part about her living by her charms. Well, that could have been anything. She's a performer, after all. You said she lost her parents. She's probably been fending for herself for years. I don't think anyone who survived the war in the years after can blame her for that. We all did things we're not proud of. You didn't. Mm. Didn't I? We all did. Maybe you were too little to remember. Maybe you didn't know how bad it really was. How can you say that? That's all I remember, he shot back. Then be kind, Corio, and try not to look down on people who had to choose between death and disgrace. Tigress' rebuke shocked him, but less than her alluding to behavior that might be considered a disgrace. What had she done? Because if she'd done it, she'd done it to protect him. He thought about the morning of the reaping when he'd casually wondered what she had to trade in the black market, but he never really had taken that seriously. Or hadn't he? Uh -huh. Would he have just preferred not to know what sacrifices she might be willing to make for him? Her comment was vague enough, and so many things were beneath a snow that he could say, as she had of Lucy Gray's song, well, that could be anything. Did he want to know all the details? No, the truth was he did not. Yeah. yeah. There's a moment when uh, the peacekeepers come and get Lucy Gray after her performance, and he says... Uh, the two male peacekeepers who appeared at her side treated her with a certain friendliness now, asking if she was ready to go, trying to keep their smiles contained. Just like those peacekeepers in 12, he couldn't help but wondering just how friendly she could be. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All this after one song, sir? One song? <laughs> yeah. This man is, uh, I don't know what kind of person he, like, what would satisfy him? How much does somebody's life have to entirely revolve around him before he begins to feel, like, secure? All of it. I guess so, right? I guess All that's the the real, like... At the the bottom of everything. Uh, anyway, so there's a, a little moment where they get excited because the um, the apartment building's elevator uh, is yeah. again, <laughs> and they're really psyched about it until he starts being like, "Wait." Do you think that they're doing this because they're going to be selling the building and people are like, you know, and she it takes all the fun out of the moment they had been having yeah. a lovely time yeah and he's got this homework assignment that dr gall had uh assigned where they need to write an essay about what they liked about the war and everybody is just like uh there was nothing <laughs> so these are all yeah. going to be really short and uh he gets home and is having trouble with it. Um, I also want to mention too briefly when he does get home, um, grandmam is just like, that was delightful. <laughs> yeah. He's like, damn, she impressed her. <laughs> there had been a point where grandmam says something like she, she's almost not even district, which is like the mm -hmm. greatest compliment she right? could give. And when he leaves the next day, she's just like, tell her we're very sorry she has to die or some shit like that. <laughs> I swear to God, these people are. <sighs> how do you not? I mean, how, how, do, do you not hear yourself? No, mm -hmm. I guess no. you don't. I guess no. you don't. But, um, uh, but this ends up having this, this assignment ends up making him ass Tigress. Mm -hmm. What does she remember? Was there anything at all that they liked? And she has uh, a couple of things that she brings up. Uh, the uniforms and that uh, they used to like to watch a parade. And he he remembers a little bit of like 
standing from the windows and watching the soldiers and the marching bra- marching bands. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's taking notes. Um, and then there's a memory of a, the turkey, which is something that he hadn't thought about in a long time, which was actually a pretty big deal. There was like a Memorial Day um, celebration that they had on television called Heroes Day. And his father had died. And so his father was one of the heroes that was um, memorialized. And they're like watching it in this giant empty penthouse that doesn't have any heat. So they're all like bundled into their grandmom's bed watching this broadcast. And they get a knock at the door. And it is um, a gift basket with um a fucking turkey which is the most important thing yes uh, a 20 pound frozen turkey with uh some like jelly like a lot of old rations like one of one of the things is described as being dusty there's like a dented can of something else <laughs> like a couple of sticks of candy uh that are broken a, right like a sponge and a, and a flower scented candle but this is like a big deal. Like Tigress bursts into tears at the sight of all of this because these people have been starving. And this is like the most luxurious thing that they could get. Um, and the first thing that they do is as soon as the messengers leave or the t- soldiers leave, they like lock the door to make sure nobody comes in. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's him. That's his first instinct is to just be like, nobody's coming for us. Shit. Get out of here. Lock the door and protect their newfound riches. Um, And they invite... Tiger stays home the next day so that she can figure out how to cook it and everything. And she would have been like a little kid at the time when this happened and she still figured out how to do it. And uh, they invite Pluribus over and... uh, they Tigress finds a recipe book and she figures that shit out and she makes like a wonderful meal for them. And um it's like one of the best memories. And what he writes down in his little notes is relief from deprivation. Yeah. That's his like shorthand note for this memory. Which I you know, I mean you could shorthand this memory lots of things. And the phrase that he adds is relief from deprivation, which I feel like is really, really important for what the the, games become, what the the games become. And also his, the way he handles the districts and, and you know, what, what it means. I think the one thing that we're learning about snow and the way that he, he was brought up and what he lived through is that gave him an incredible insight into the districts and, and how to control them for so long because he can recall what are the things that kept me or my family holding on. And, you know, when he gives that whole, like hope it's hope, you know, that whole speech, but, um, but that's like firsthand gained knowledge. That's the thing. Those are the things that keep you going. And if you could just dangle enough of those little things periodically, you can string people along <laughs> for their entire yeah. lives. You sure can. <laughs> God. I remember a moment when I was still married to Brendan where I had like the one of those like revelations about capitalism. That's like, you know, baby step number one Mm -hmm. about just the fact that like, I I said something about how we don't have the basics for a good life. And Brendan's response was something about like, everybody I know has an iPhone and a flat screen TV. And I was like, does everybody, you know, have healthcare? Like, and it was, I didn't even like think about it myself until Mm -hmm. I said it to him. Mm -hmm. You know how that can be sometimes Mm -hmm. something comes out of your mouth and you're like, wait, Oh, (laughs) I may have just made a good point. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it is just, we, if, if we have enough toys and things to give us a momentary happiness, it really can get us through in a way that's like meant, I think as a coping mechanism that's like supposed to help us as human beings, but has been exploited to keep us, down mm-hmm. just essentially down yep um 
So, yeah, and they start talking about, like, the parades and stuff as well, which he puts down, but he doesn't bring that shit up in class the next day. He feels kind of uh, embarrassed yeah. that everything he came up with was very materialistic, <coughs> really, and, like, mm-hmm. superficial almost in a way. Yeah. And everything everybody else is talking about is how they were inspired by the bravery of the troops yeah. fighting for a greater cause. It was like we were part of something. And it's definitely him just sort of being like, <clears throat> No, no, I don't. I don't yeah, have anything yeah. to. I he tells the turkey story, and that's it. Right, like he adds a paragraph after like the turkey and the parsley bit that really speaks to to who he is, and he he adds uh, he adds it because he he's not satisfied with just the child what he calls the childish delights. So he starts thinking about what the last few weeks have been like with the bombing and Marcus's escape. And he adds on that he had a deep relief on winning the war. And this is really for Dr. Gall's benefit, I think. But also, I think it speaks to him as well. I think it's a real moment of truth. But I think he's writing it. I think he thinks he's writing it because it is going to be good for the assignment. But But he says that... Um, there was a deep relief when they won the war. There was satisfaction at seeing the capital's enemies who treated him so cruelly, who cost him his family, brought to their knees, hobbled, impotent, unable to hurt him anymore. He loved the sense of safety that their defeat had brought. And that security could only come with power, the ability to control things. That is what he loved best of all. And there it is. I mean, that's it. That's the ability to control things. That's that's all. Since it was meows, uh, uh, Rashawn, that 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 was the squeaking of the hinges of our. Oh <laughs> damn it! I thought that was squeak. Oh, uh, that's hilarious! Oh I my have god, been, been fooled, been bamboozled, fooled me, fooled me, Jerry. God. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm going to tell him later that you were like, oh, about him so, having to go take a shit. Yeah, I got so excited <laughs> for all the wrong things, as is my way. Uh, um, and so Janus, of course, in true fashion, the only thing I loved about the war was the fact that I still lived at home. If you are asking me if it had any value beyond that, I would say it was an opportunity to right some wrongs. And did it? Not at all. Things in the districts are worse than ever. And everybody is just horrified. Whoa, whoa, this. whoa, like, whoa, he whoa! Just buddy. Really went too far. This whoa, time. whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Go back to two, then. Who'd miss you? <laughs> He's really pushing it now. Thought Coriolanus, but he was angry too. It took two parties to make a war. Mm. A war that, by the way, the rebels had started. Um, it doesn't take two. To make a war, actually. Not really. Yeah. It sure don't. It sure don't. It sure don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he doesn't, uh, uh, Snow doesn't, like, say anything. He thinks all this, but he doesn't, he doesn't uh, argue with Sejanus or join the the resounding, uh, you know, shutdown that's coming from the rest of the class. And uh, then Sejanus is just, like, asking Dr. Gall, what did you love about it then? Since you want to, you know... What you got to say about it? Mm-hmm. And she said, I love how it proved me right. And then it's like, Bell rings, oh. class dismissed. <laughs> Come the fuck on. Uh, yeah. Please. Yeah. I was, I, I'm not a huge fan of this. We have talked about this across several, several properties. Neither one of us are fans of this particular type of writing style. This, this thing here where we, you know, we, we we bring up something really important that is desperate for like additional conversation and just cut it off at the knees like that. Mm-hmm. I my patience for that is very thin. Yeah, agreed. And uh, agreed. She's, she's pulled it twice now. <laughs> oh, that. yeah. That, it is true. Like they both happen within the same section, which mm-hmm. is like particularly egregious. Mm-hmm. Like, come on. So I'm going to need Suzanne Collins to calm the fuck down. 
with this particular <laughs> <laughs> little device. Um, she's going to need her to calm down. She's not going to get too many more of these before I call it. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> so, okay. There's, uh, you know, some talk about, like, how everybody's tributes are doing in terms of their overall chances here. Um, hilarious, which I will never recover from that name. I know, right? Says the trouble with girls is they're not used to fighting the same way boys are. Oh, I don't know, said Festus. I think my coral would give any of those guys a run for their money. Mine's a runt. Hilarious picked at a steak sandwich with his manicured nails. Wovey, she calls herself. Well, I tried to train old Wovey for the interview, but zero personality. No one's backed her, so I can't feed her even if she can avoid the others. The fucking- if she stays alive, she'll get backers. Are you even listening to me? She can't fight, and I've no money to work with since my family can't bet. I'm just hoping she lasts until the final 12 so I can face my parents. They're embarrassed to heavens be making such a poor showing. What a weird system this is. That, that he is lamenting that his is a runt. While he picks at his steak sandwich with his manicured nails. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, be for fucking real. <laughs> it's just such a perfect little microcosm. And then you she know? says she has him. Uh, when, when aren't you even listening to me part? She's It's hilarious wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um... And I love when, when Corey Linus got a thrill when he saw himself slotted in at 815 the following morning until Lucky said, we wanted to make sure to get you in early, you know, before your girl buys it. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus fucking Christ. Christ. Oh, God. Um, (laughs) Livia was bitter and Dr. Gall insane so he'd been able to ignore their certainty Lucy Gray wasn't a contender but somehow goofy lucky Flickerman's words hit home in a way theirs could not as he walked back to the apartments to prepare for his final meeting with Lucy Gray he ruminated over the likelihood she'd be dead by the same time tomorrow the previous, previous night's jealousy over her loser of a boyfriend and the way her star quality sometimes outshone his own evaporated Oh, interesting. I don't mm-hmm. think I noticed that the first time. Yeah, there the it is. The way though. her star quality out sometimes outshone his own. Mm-hmm. So it was a little bit what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, apparently. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um so yeah, he's just gets depressed over this whole thing. And I we kind of like skip past it, but he thinks at one point about how he hasn't gone to see Clemencia. Yeah. And he's like, has she turned entirely into a snake? No, 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 no. That's crazy. And then he's like, what if I go visit her and they decide to grab me and hold me? And then he's like, they could have done that any time. Like, he just keeps having these sort of yeah. thoughts and then being but, like, you're being irrational. But still hasn't gone to see her, though. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really sure. Like... The thing is with just being like, it's irrational about them, like grabbing him and keeping him maybe, but like her turning into a snake did seem like what was happening there. I don't, I mean, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I also am concerned for her. Um, He's like, maybe the doctor was just lying to me with his, like his excuses and his explanations. And, you know, I mean, it's possible. It's been a couple (laughs) days. I mean. So I'm very curious if he will go back to visit her, like if he will, or if he will just decide that it doesn't matter and he's got more important things. I think if he, if he keeps putting it off, he's going to be too engrossed in the games and then that will just be the excuse for why he doesn't have time to go because he's got this more important shit to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How convenient. Um, so, okay. (laughs) Uh, The thing is, Lysistrata whispered to Coriolanus, I've become rather attached to Jessup. He did save my life. Coriolanus wondered what Lysistrata, who had been closer to him than anyone else in the arena, had seen when the bombs went off. Had she seen Lucy Gray save him? Was she hinting at that? Cory, why don't you just 
ever believe that maybe somebody's talking about themselves for a change? Jesus Christ, they, No, they don't, they don't exist. They're not real people. <laughs> oh, my God. For what reason? <sighs> All right. So, so he shows up with this box the night before, because uh, this is the next morning when he's talking to um, La Sistrata. Ooh, that's quite a name. Um, yeah, it's a good name. And they put a, he's thinking about something to give her to take into the arena that will be like something of his own that will be like he's in there with her. He thinks about giving her this orange scarf. He doesn't want to do roses again. And they put together this box, Tigress mainly, and it's a, there's food in it. There's a sandwich in it for her. There is, um, the box is decorated with two brightly plumed birds and arranged the food inside. It's a pretty, uh, snowy white, like linen thingamajig, uh, and a, one little rose and a really pretty shade of peach. Um, mm -hmm. And he shows up to see Lucy Gray this last time with this beautiful box. And um, she is really emotional because the reality of what's about to happen is like sitting, finally hitting. And she yeah. can't really play it off anymore. Like to the point where she does, she barely even eats. And we know she's hungry and she, you know, she can't even eat and she's crying and he's like wiping the tears away. Um, and she's telling him how at all the other tributes, like, she's like, things are getting weird, yo. Things, mm -hmm. are, th things are weird. <laughs> like, first of all, Reaper is just going around and apologizing for having to kill us. Like, I'm really sorry <sighs> I'm going to have to kill you tomorrow or in the next day or two. <laughs> and that's, that's weird. <laughs> I really love the fact that uh, she finally gets a chance to sort of open up about being afraid mm -hmm. and how, you know, like I, she has been so poised and collected for all of this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even riding down the street with a corpse dangling above her head, yep. you know, yep. and I, even though it's like just in private with him. Mm -hmm. The fact that she gets to just be like, I'm freaking out. I'm yeah. freaking out. We're all freaking out. Yeah, she's managed like, okay, to good. sort of maintain an air of not being touched by what's happening around her, which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons I think that she's so popular is that she is allowing the illusion that this is not the worst thing that's ever fucking happened, you know? Yeah. Um she's she's opening up space for that for that um charade you know and i believe we, you mean charade i do mean charade <laughs> <laughs> uh and this is a moment where the the veil is sort of lifted and we get to see what she really is which is a terrified young woman who is facing pretty immediate or at least very imminent death. <laughs> um, and it's one of the first times we really see it. And it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, hmm. <sighs> so let's see. Um, I, th I think I will eat one last meal like a civilized person. That, there's a lot so you can share it with Jessup. He stopped eating. Might be nerves. Of course, all kinds of crazies coming out of our mouths now. I do like the way that's phrased. Yeah, me It's too. just like, yeah, they open up and it just, whatever it is, just comes out and <laughs> it's very unpredictable. <laughs> I feel that way myself sometimes. Same. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was a meme I saw the other day and it was... Uh, a woman standing in her kitchen with a KitchenAid mixer and the KitchenAid mixer was labeled what I intended to say. And then this woman is just covered in flour because she clearly like fucked up and turned it on too fast. And it just, and she is labeled the absolute unhinged fucked up shit that came out of my mouth. <laughs> and it's just like, oh man, that can be me sometimes. Like you'd think that 
talking publicly on the show as much as I do, I'd feel a little bit more competent with that sort of thing. And then, and then there, I, I mentioned this on the recording with miles today, but yesterday I was recording a spoil me. Oh my God. (laughs) I started off like, well, um, this are the chapters where such and such welcome to spoil me. And then I start the episode and I'm like, well, I'm going to show everybody this is Natasha. Blah, blah, blah. And these chapters such and such welcome to spoil me. <laughs> and I just did another intro again. And like, ca- like, as I was saying it, I was like, what? You just did that. But it was too late. It was already out. <laughs> and, uh, and those are sometimes live, it right? Sometimes like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was live. That was, I could have edited it out when I, like well yeah sure the recording but and i thought about it and i was just like i can't i just gotta leave it in there because that is just <laughs> that is hilarious like i truly lost the thread entirely for a moment <laughs> i really was wondering like what if i did that when i was on with rashawn like what would she oh my do God. what would she say <laughs> just be like um sweetie <laughs> you okay <laughs> Are you having are you having a stroke? Should I do I need to text Owen? In? <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? Oh god. Um so yeah, he mentions she has triple the gifts of anybody else. Mm-hmm. You're going to win this thing. I've thought it through. The moment they hit that gong, you run as fast as you can, put as much distance between yourself and the others. Can I? I'm the one who pushed you to believe in me. But last night I got to thinking about being in that arena, trapped all those weapons. And he says, Oh, Lucy gray. I don't want to die. Of course you won't. And I won't let you, you should let me. I've never been anything but trouble to you, putting you in danger and eating your food. And I could tell you hated my ballad. I hated that. She included that. I felt so bad. Yeah. Like, uh, it's just Corey and Lanus. Why do you have to ruin everything so much all the time? <laughs> um, and so he says, I'll be a wreck. When I told you you mattered to me, I didn't mean as a tribute. I meant as you. And when she says, I feel so alone, he says, you're not, and you won't be in the arena. We'll be together. I'll be there every moment. I won't take my eyes off you. And I was just like, I understand your intent here but she absolutely will be alone sir sorry about it but like there's just just watching her that's not that's not that's nothing it just i am i totally respect the fact that she didn't point it out she's accepting what he is offering here and that's kind of her in my opinion but i couldn't help but think how irritated i would be by that if i were her you know Mm -hmm. um so eventually he is like okay i have to give a grand gesture and he holds out this compact that was his mother's that we saw him toying with Mm -hmm. on a bad day to cheer Mm -hmm. himself up and he says it's a loan mind you i fully expect you to return it to me otherwise i could never part with it And I love that she's like, this is too beautiful. I can't take it. And he says, are you sure? And shows her that it has a mirror inside. And she starts laughing. It's like, oh, you've got me pegged. Okay. She noticed the empty well where the cake of powder had sat an hour earlier. Did there used to be powder here? There did, but he paused. If he said it, there was no going back. On the other hand, if he didn't, he might be losing her for good. His voice dropped to a whisper. I thought you might want to use your own. And that's the end of the that's chapter. That's the end of the chapter. I want to mention, because I don't, I, I don't know. I feel like I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Like, I don't know what powder she's going to use of her own. I feel mm-hmm. like I forgot something or if this is just something we don't know yet. It's something that we could piece together, but I didn't. On my first reading, like the only thing I think, the only kind of powder I think that she would have, she would have, and I don't know if she would still have any, 
would be like coal dust. So she can't possibly have coal dust from District 12 still on her person or anywhere near her. That is not it. And then, like, I don't know, like, what else is happening. I I really honestly don't know if we could piece it together. Like, piece it from, is it something that she would have been given since she's been in the Capitol? Did he put something in the box? Yes. No, it's not something from him. You want me to just go ahead and read the next? uh, I'm going to read you the first. Well, no, no, don't do that yet. Why? Because there's some other stuff in the chapters we just read that I want to talk about before we do anything new. Oh, okay. The part that we kind of skipped over when... Shit, I just had it and then I stopped to go back to look at the compact part. It's okay. So they're (laughs) they're still in class and they're talking about... um, Let's see, Dr. Gall, morning person, Capitol, Flickerman. Look at all those people, Dr. Call, Dr. Gall said, sending bread to a slip of a girl with a broken heart, even though they don't believe she can win. What's the lesson there? And then people said, uh, someone's like, at the dog fights, people love betting on mutts that can barely stand. People love a long shot. People love a good love song. People are fools. She doesn't stand a chance. And then someone says, but there are a lot of romantics. Yes, Dr. Gall says, romantic notions, idealistic notions can be very attractive. And uh, I was like, hmm, that just made me think of <laughs> Peta and Katniss. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But, um, but uh, okay, so you want to tell me what's in the next, read me the next little bit? All right, so I'm just going to like the next like like two paragraphs. Lucy Gray understood instantly. Her eyes darted to the peacekeepers, none of whom were paying attention, and she leaned in and took a sniff of the compact. Mmm, you can still smell it, though. Lovely. Like roses, he said. Like you, she said. It really would be like having you with me, wouldn't it? Go on, he urged her. Take me with you. Take it. Lucy Gray wiped away her tears with the back of her hand. Okay, but it's a loner. She took the compact, slipped it into her pocket, and gave it a pat. It helps to clarify my thinking. Somehow, winning the games is just too large a thing to conceive of. But if I say, I need to get this back to Coriolanus, I can wrap my mind around that. They talked a bit more, mostly about the layout of the arena and where the best hiding places might be, and he got half of the sandwich and all of a peach into her by the time Professor Sickle blew her whistle. Coriolanus wasn't sure how it happened, but they must have both risen, both moved forward, because he found her in his arms, her hands clutching his shirt front, as he locked her in an embrace. You're all I'm going to think about in that arena, she whispered. Not that guy back in 12, he said, only (laughs) half-jokingly. No, he made sure he killed anything I felt for him, she said. The only boy my heart has a sweet spot for now is you. And then she gave him a kiss, not a peck, a real kiss on the lips with hints of peach and powder. The feel of her mouth, soft and warm against his own, sent sensations surging through his body. Rather than pulling back, he held her even tighter as the taste and touch of her made his head spin. So this was what people were talking about. This was what made them so crazy. When they finally broke apart, he drew a deep breath as if surfacing from the depths. Lucy Gray's lashes fluttered open, and the look in her eyes matched his own. They simultaneously leaned in for another kiss when the peacekeepers laid hands on her and led her away. Festus nudged him on the way out of the hall. Sorry, it's taking a little longer to get to this than I thought, but it will. Uh, That was some goodbye. Coriolanus just shrugged. What can I say? I'm irresistible. I guess... Festus answered. I tried to give Coral a reassuring pat on the shoulder and she about broke my wrist. (laughs) The kiss left him giddy. Beyond a doubt, he'd crossed a line, but he didn't regret it. It had been amazing. He walked home alone, savoring the bittersweet parting, electrified by his daring. Maybe he'd broken a rule or two by giving her the compact and suggesting she fill it with rat poison. Who knew? There was no real rule book for the Hunger Games. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, that's pretty smart. 
I um Oh, we're gonna do a thing, aren't we? They're kissing now. <laughs> is this a kissing book? God, is this a kissing book? <laughs> is it, it's not one of the top five greatest kisses of all time, I'll tell you that much. It sure ain't. <laughs> <laughs> The rat poison is pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah, I do like it just as a concept of, like, her talking about, well, I could kill in self-defense. And that sort of suggests that, like, it, even that might be hard for her, you know? Poison is so much more passive that's perhaps an option that would be easier to consider. I mean, all she's got to fucking do is if she's the tribute getting gifts and the other ones aren't, all she has to do is leave some fucking food laying around. Yeah. That's it. Just, mm-hmm. You know, whoever finds it's going to eat it immediately and boom, done. Done. That's like actually fucking genius. All right. Well, well, well. Um, I'm going to do one last, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know why that air horn is so much louder than everything else but it does make me laugh um welcome i have because i hadn't done it in i thought just one week but it has to have been longer than that so i'm sorry for neglecting my duties here guys but um we have got a good group here new patrons are rose mel bryce h52 ryan Gil, Jessica Maloney, Bessie Knight, and William Verduce. Yay! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for pledging and becoming part of the the illustrious, unspoiled fan network. I need to come up with like a some sort of like group. You know how how we've got the barbs for uh <laughs> Nicki Minaj yes. and we've got the hotties for Megan the Stallion. <laughs> the, what is Unspoiled has I guess it would be the Brats. It like was the Brats. Okay. All right. Thank you thank you guys all for becoming Brats. It sounds not good though. Right? I feel like that doesn't sound good. It's fine. Um but yeah, we really, really appreciate y'all and uh literally helping us to like just like keep the lights on and stuff. It is so appreciated. I know times are hard out there, but uh if y'all okay, have to live. <laughs> <laughs> I I wanna be clear about what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Live. Um but yeah, if you've got an extra five bucks per month that you can spare. I think you will find that you get quite a lot for that $5. It's a quite a bang for your buck. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, come in and hang out in the discord as well. We have a spoiler chat, which is pretty active and a lot of, uh, chatter happening about expectations with the new book that'll be coming out. I don't even remember when that book is supposed to drop. I'm I sure. Let me, let me already. I did know because I had just uh, been engaged with the post about it, reading people's comments and whatnot. And I have yeah. already forgotten when they said it's coming, but I feel like it's sort of soon. Okay. So it is sunrise sunrise on the reaping is the name of it. Cause I think I got it wrong last time. It's supposed to come out March of 2025. 2025 jesus yeah it like it sounds like super far away and you realize it's like eh, yeah a little less than a you know not even a year away Mm. Mm. yeah you guys it's absurd i'm old how am i so old girl (sighs) when when did this happen it 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 uh (laughs) <laughs> i don't want to talk about it <laughs> but yeah so we'll have like a a break in there and then i'm definitely going to want to cover the next book but i want to read it before you do so just fyi guys that we're not going to start covering the book like as soon as it's out we'll definitely have to figure out where it fits into the schedule i'm gonna have to have time to read it and uh depending on what else we're covering at the time because there's also the possibility that a new dresden book is going to drop at the end of this year beginning of next year and that will take priority because uh this 
Sunrise on the Reaping is not part of an ongoing story. It's just another installment in the universe. Whereas Dresden, it's the next installment of a story. And I really want us to get on that. So, um, but yeah, I just wanted to keep you guys abreast of my, my thinking on how this will go. My strategy. Mm. Wendy, is stratagem plural for strategy? I think so. But like, I, I think also saying strategies is not wrong. So I'm not sure. I'm looking up stratagem versus strategy because I'm just like, you know, stratagem is sometimes synonymous with strategy in military contexts, but its primary definition is a clever scheme for achieving an objective. So while strategy can denote any plan of action, stratagem usually implies subterfuge or unconventional tactics. Ooh, like rat poison. <laughs> oh, bring it back. So that would Look be at that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we really appreciate y'all. And again, patreon.com slash unspoiled. If you would like to support us, get access to these episodes early and ad free access to a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Suki is going to be, we have only one book left in that series and a couple short stories, and then we'll be moving into Mistborn. And uh, yeah, there's just, there's just a lot going on. There's so much going on. So check it out and support us and support everybody you can on Patreon because uh, artists really need it. It's tough out there for us guys. I hesitate to call myself an artist in respect to like a, the podcast because that feels overstating it a bit mm -hmm. but i am also actually an artist so i'm like ah it still counts yeah um but yeah you know creators creators is a better there you go umbrella term i guess yeah um but yeah you know guys there's this, did you see this thing about the new adobe like i saw like one reference to it and then the thing about Microsoft took over and that's all I've been hearing about. So I don't know Freaking, what Adobe's doing. For those who aren't aware, Adobe has included in their new like terms of use for their fucking their it, you they have ownership over anything you create using their software and can do what they want with it. It's lunacy. Really? Like, yeah. It's like a blanket it's ours. Wow. The language is so broad and so it's so the gall, the audacity. I mean, it's just, and this is what it's like. They have ownership of it. And also guess what? AI is going to do a bunch of stuff. So does anybody own anything they make themselves anymore? Like what is, what is anything? No, we are <sighs> all not just NBCs. <laughs> Y'all, I have such a bee in my bonnet about AI images. I really do. I still see them getting shared all over the place. And it's especially like prevalent in groups that I'm in on Facebook that have an older crowd because they seem like particularly unable to s suss out when something is AI. And then everybody gets really pissed when you point out that it's AI, like you're like yelling at them. <laughs> but it's like, you're sharing something and everybody's like, oh my God, where do I buy it? Or how did they do that? They didn't. It's not real. So folks are getting all excited about the possibility of something they can create or achieve. And it's not possible. It's not real. And setting aside all of the stuff that is being done to artists with AI, just don't fucking use AI for, for art. Guys, don't do it. Don't share it. It's gross. Every time, anytime I see it shared, if the person isn't aware, I try and tell them as, like, as gently as I can, like, look, this does not look real. And if they just dig in about it, I think that you kind of suck as a person. If you're Ooh. like, oh, sorry, I didn't know then cool and just like keep an eye out you know be more vigilant i get sometimes caught up thinking something's real and it's not <coughs> excuse me but i just really want us to, to present a united front because artists have already not been given like respect in our culture it's just a, a weird sort of disconnect we have where we love art but we also think it's like 
not worth anything mm-hmm. and should be free. Why don't we make art the way we used to? Well, because we don't support it and have patrons like we used to. Patrons. <laughs> well, well, we do. But, uh, most. Patreon.com slash <laughs> You know, there's a reason it's called that, y'all. They didn't just make it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Y'all are, y'all are, uh, all like, I go, I, I imagine myself being a bard that travels to everybody's homes who's on my patrons list <laughs> and stays with each of them, entertaining them for like a week or two and, you know, dining with you and telling stories. And then I just move on <laughs> to the next home and get to travel the countryside. So, uh, yeah, guys, you yeah. know, it really is though. It's wild how like important it was that all of the great artists that we, we laud and hold up, and we don't how disconnected we are from how they were able to live and make that art, how that shit was possible, you know, yeah. and, and how recent, you know, like I know a lot of times when the topic comes up, people tend to think like you're, you know, your example of bar traveling, from, you know, castle to castle or whatever, or, you know, that it was some sort of ancient or medieval thing that we did. And that system was in place and in, well into the early 20th century you know Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. a lot of the uh early especially like black creators that i like look to and love you know the langston Mm -hmm. hughes and the zora neil hurstons you know the county collins like those were people that were like almost fully supported by patrons like that's how they were able to create you know um yeah, like without it, these people would have to like work regular fucking jobs or they would starve and there would be no great books of poetry, you know. We yeah. wouldn't have any of that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um uh, so anyway guys, patreon.com slash unspoiled support us, don't share AI art, support other artists. If you can't like become a patron, totally get it. But try uh retweeting I say retweeting, but like nobody's on Twitter anymore except Miles. Uh, Repost things, share things. You know, Miles knows. He knows that I mock him for that and he's okay with it. Um, Guys, if you want to get really bummed out by hearing a lot about Palestine and also find out things you didn't want to know about wrestling, go to follow MJ Schneiderman on Twitter. Um, But yeah, sharing things and and word of mouth and, and mentioning with links in spaces where other fans are it's like the primary way people find our work because i can't afford advertising like there's a minute there where i could maybe have afforded it and then that bubble burst the yeah. pandemic bubble and uh no longer <laughs> we're just talking about i was just talking to cam earlier today and I, honest to god was thinking about the good old days of the pandemic <laughs> literally but we had like a short moment of a glimpse of like what the what we could look like Mm -hmm. you know it was really something you know we had (laughs) minus people yelling at steward yeah right yeah like like (laughs) like like it was like what what we were talking about was how like the world the outside world was like falling apart but what it caused us to do as like individuals because we all became suddenly so isolated that we leaned heavily on the communities that we had created in a much more intimate way. Mm -hmm, And people mm -hmm. started spending like a lot of time together virtually. um, And we had the capability before the pandemic, but we, I don't think it was in our, it just wasn't in our, like in our mind that we could do that. Like, just yeah. jump together and, like, all be together on a Zoom call or whatever you were using. And that we had, like, in- people had income, so they weren't starving. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, people were able to live and weren't dying at their jobs, working 70 hours a week for nothing. So they had, like, energy to, to put into other things. And people started crafting and creating shit. People started baking and cooking and it was really, it was, it was, it was such a, it was like a horrible thing to go through the pandemic and the lives that were lost, but it had this other side to it. 
and it was just like, oh, you know, we had all this energy for like caring for other people and social justice. And it was the summer of 2020 when George Floyd, it just, it was a, such a weird time. But, yeah. um, but yeah, they said, oh, look at all those people that, you know, are li- living. Have the free time to protest. Right. Stop and stop gotta that. put them, gotta fucking nip that shit in the butt. Yep. <laughs> And then they raised prices and blamed inflation to punish us all for those years. <laughs> blamed inflation like two years after the pandemic. Get the fuck out of my face with this shit. Ugh. Supply chain. <laughs> I swear. I, the insult. The insult. Like, just tell me you're gouging me. Like, I can't do anything more about it if you tell me than if you don't. So why don't you just say it right? and stop gaslighting me with this? Ugh. Disgusted. Anyway, capitalism. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We love you very much. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye, guys. Are you, are you coming to the tree where dead men call out for his love to be? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met and lived right in the hanging tree. That was an unspoiled network podcast.